Welcome to Zoo Town Church. We're glad you're here. Looking for more ways to stay connected with the zoo? Download the app. You can find it on any Windows, Apple, or Android device. On the app, you can view past sermons and share the content directly to your social media. This is a great way to help preach the gospel to Missoula and beyond. If you can't make it to a service, you can also watch live stream directly on your phone. Make sure to check out all the extra content as well, like the Year of the Word reading plan and the interactive notes. Interactive notes are actually prepared by the pastors for their individual sermons. You can also add your own notes into the mix. So head over to the App Store, download the app, and we hope you enjoy the message. Yeah, if you are new with us, uh, we are doing a series right now about the Father. It's called Love Dad. It's about looking at who the Father is, your real Father in heaven. I know you all have earthly fathers, um, have parents, all kinds of stuff, but we need to know right now in our country, in our world, with all the chaos, all the stuff going on, the Holy Spirit told me, tell them about the Father, because we really need a Father. And every week we're making a video, and we're showing you a different side of God, a different side of the Father, and last week was Father the Adopter. So check out this video, and then we'll hit into the sermon. Most people feel sorry for the orphans on TV, which is good, but I see millions of orphans who don't know it. So many of my kids continue to live as though they have no home and no father. They work and work looking for the thing that is already offered to them. To those who hear my voice and respond, I give you the right to cry out, Papa, and I come running to meet you. I'm so happy you came home. Love, Dad. So yeah, the word adoption is, is a good word, but we also look at it as a sad word because it's basically, you know, someone didn't want that child. And, and in the world of orphans, like they bounce from thing to thing, from place to place, they're kind of slaves to the system. And that's how God sees all of us, that it doesn't matter if you have real parents, doesn't matter if you have a family, doesn't matter if you have a, a successful career, until you are um, embraced by the real father, the father in heaven, you are kind of bounce around from thing to thing, looking for that thing that God already offers you, his free love. And so that's a really important thing that everyone needs to grasp, that the Father loves you, he adopted you through his, the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, and it's not because you're cool, it's not because you're good looking, it's not because you have a certain skill set or that he wants to use you for something, it's because you're his kid. It's because you're his kid. And so he came to adopt the whole world to himself, and I, don't, I know if you've come here a little bit, you, you know that I can get a little misty-eyed up here from time to time. I don't know why you're laughing at that. It's seriously, I cry. I cry up here. And I don't go crying all the time during the week. Ask my wife. She'll be like, no, he cries all the time. Don't listen to him. But I mean, literally, we think about putting plastic bags under the front row here so you guys can like get the tears, you know, just flowing down on you guys. But I get a lot of, I get like some guff for that. And I know it freaks you men out for sure. Like it totally freaks you men out to see another man up here who's just so good looking and so strong crying up here. But... I had this, this, this friend of church sent this to me, that it says that people who cry are actually the most, like, strongest people in the world. Like, they're the strongest people who can share that emotion. Listen to this. Number one, it means you're not afraid of your emotions. Crying forces you to confront whatever you're feeling, whether it's disappointment, sadness, anger, or frustration. And let's face it, confronting your emotions is not easy. It's much easier in the short term anyway to suppress those emotions, particularly when they're negative. Doing the opposite requires strength, bravery, and the ability to look inwards. Number two, crying shows a lack of concern for social expectations. While crying won't get you killed or imprisoned, <laughs> thank God for me, it does remain frowned upon in society for both genders. Men who cry are stigmatized as weak and unmanly. When women cry, they're often called crazy or dramatic. <laughs> I don't know why I thought that was funny, ladies, forgive me. <laughs> I'm a crier, I relate. While crying, or excuse me, crying despite the stigmatization shows that you're not afraid to put social convention aside, I meaning you don't care what people think. If it means dealing with your overwhelming emotions, it actually equals strength if you can cry. Number three, crying makes you a leader. 
By openly crying, you liberate people around you. This is especially true if your tears are in response to a shared circumstance. Say you and a group of friends receive some upsetting news. If you decide to be strong and shed the first tear, the others will go, hey, I guess it's okay to show emotion right now. Congrats, you are a leader. One that people won't fear judgment from. Number four, crying shows that you know how to offload stress before it breaks you. In a world of architecture, strength is, is about much more than hardiness. A good, sturdy structure relieve stress effectively before it becomes destructive. A strong person is no different. For many people, crying relieves built up stress that could easily become damaging if not dealt with properly. You're welcome, Zootown. Not only that, my wife sent me an article this week that said bald men are respected more and they are listened to more. So I got the whole package. Now, I'll be honest, I would rather have you disrespect me and have hair. <laughs> I'll be straight up. <laughs> But here's the reason I say this, because today we're going to look at Father, the lover. He's a lover. And for some of you men, this is going to be incredibly hard for you. It's going to be tough, because you don't want to share that emotion. You don't want to, you struggle crying, you struggle even knowing what love is, because we're taught that in society. We're taught that in our world. Well, let me show you a video that, could sh that should just clear all this up, that men can cry, men can show emotion, and that this is a good thing to receive the Father's love today. Man, if they can do it, you can do it. Am I right? Come on, man. These are, these are tough dudes, tough men and women out there. But it doesn't mean that we can't feel this emotion. And I can tell you, this week, and that's why 8.30 was long, and that's why the parking was crazy out there, because I struggled this week with this sermon. Because the word love is the most misused, misrepresented word in all our culture. We think love just means so many different things. Most of the time, we think it means sex. That's what we think of when we think of love. And it is so misused, and it's so just thrown around there, we don't even know what real love is. So then when I'm saying, trying to tell you that Father loves you, it almost sounds too simple. Especially you, people who've been in church forever, it just says, oh yeah, God loves us. No, 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 don't think that. I want this to be profound into your life. I want this to be profound into your hearts. I want you to receive this. And so all week I was even like, where do I even go with this? The word love is so broad. The word that God loves you is so big. How do I even do this? So this is going to be a free sermon. I'm just talking to you. It might make sense. It might not. But I want you to feel my heart. I want you to feel my heart. I'm not faking it. When I cry, I'm not faking it. I love you and I love people. Other people. I love God and I love you. <laughs> I'm not doing this to like work you up so you receive the gospel. I don't want to be up here doing it. So what I'm telling you today is I've been on this journey of receiving the Father's love and now I am just showing you what I have been going through because again, as I said last week, why when I was in Bible college did they not tell me how much the Father loved me? Everything in Christianity has become about doctrine and theology. Now, theology is amazing. You should study it because you know what theology means? The study of God. It's a good thing. 
But we have given in to society now, we've t- like about like, because we want to feel important or we want to sound like we know what we're saying. So it's all about our education, and that is truly important. But the most important thing you can get is that the Father loves you and that the Father loves other people. So this is what I do with my kids, right? Like, I, I, that's all I do with my kids is I pump them up and let them know that Father loves them. Now, do I, uh, like, agree with everything they do? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> Are there things they do that kind of dick me off? Yeah. Am I a bad dad sometimes? Absolutely. But I just over and over and over am telling my kids, I love you, Father loves you, Father loves you. I told you last week, I, sit down, I lay down with my son at night before he goes to bed, and he's usually picking his nose, you know, like just laying there. And I'm just like, you're, the, you're my favorite. Like, I love you. Your father, there's nothing you can do. I don't care what happens in your life. I don't care what sin you commit. There is nothing you can do to make me not love you. And he kind of nods his head and goes to sleep. And I'm like, you're my favorite. Don't tell Lily, but you're my favorite. <laughs> And then I'll go into Lily's room and I'm like, don't tell Easton, but you're my favorite. You're my firstborn and you're my girl. And I just pump that love into them over and over and over because I know they're going to have hard times. I know they're going to go through stuff, but I want them to know their father is about love, not rules, not discipline. Those things should come as a byproduct of them trusting their father that he loves them. But I can tell you for a long time in my Christian walk, I haven't felt it because I've been hammered and critiqued and told you need to get this down and this down and this down. And Father's like, no, you need to get this down. That I am so infatuated in love with you. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. First John three, now you gotta know, John, the author of this, everyone thinks he was a wuss because all over the gospels he kept saying, I'm the one who Jesus loves. He kept saying that. Now, if I was Peter, I'd be like, shut up, man. We get it. Gosh. But people think he was this big wuss. But John, he actually was a son of thunder. Him and his brother were nicknamed the sons of thunder. They were tough dudes. And I'm like, thunder, feel the thunder. Like, that's what I would be singing if I was him. These aren't a bunch of wussies. They were hardcore fishermen. They were down with the Romans. Like, they had a special in with the Roman centurion guards. Like, these were not a bunch of wussies. But he knew that Jesus loved him, and he felt Father's love. And this is what he tells us. 1 John 3. Look with wonder at the depth of the Father's marvelous love that he has lavished on us. Look with wonder at the depth of the Father's marvelous love that he has lavished on us. Get that down. He has called us and made us his very own beloved children. The reason the world doesn't recognize who we are is that they didn't recognize him. Beloved, we are God's children right now. See, I've always thought in Christianity, I've always thought that, you know, okay, he's tolerating me now, but then when I get to heaven, then he'll really love me because I'll get all this sin out and all this other stuff. No, 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 no. He says, right now, where you sit, you're his beloved and you're his child. However, it is not yet apparent what we will become, meaning like, yeah, we still have sin and, you know, we're getting old and we're going to die, but we're going to become something else. But we do know that when it is finally made visible, we will be just like him, for we will see him as he truly is. And all who focus their hope on him will always be purifying themselves just as Jesus is pure. So if you guys want to listen to a really good, oh, hey, (laughs) there's a baby down there. (laughs) You guys should listen to a guy named Ravi Zacharias. He's my favorite preacher. R-A-V-I, Zacharias. He was from India, and uh, he used to be a Hindu, a Buddhist, and then he tried to kill himself, became a Christian. He is the man. But what he always says, he says one of the main reasons that people miss God, the main reasons they miss this feeling from God, one of the main reasons that they don't have this emotion from God is because they have lost their wonder. We've lost our wonder. We are so impressed with ourselves because of technology. We are, and it's awesome. We are so impressed with these things and these things. Like, it's incredible. And now that stuff is happening so fast, especially in medicine, like, things are happening so fast that we're constantly looking to ourselves and we're missing that the Father put that stuff originally into the planet for us to find because he loves us. Like, do you realize we have an iPad because God put all these rocks and stuff on the earth? And it seems, it's, it's true, so we have completely lost our wonder of God. Like, we're, we're not impressed anymore with creation. We're not impressed anymore with this amazing body that he's given us. Because our heads are down all the time, just, we all get tech neck, it's a real thing, tech neck, it's, it's going to kill you. 
We are so, so we never spend the time to just sit in the Father's love. When was the last time you sat on your porch for 10 minutes and just sat in the Father's love without looking at your Instagram, all that stuff? And then we wonder like, I just don't feel God. I don't feel him. Spend time with him. When was the last time you were just like, holy cow, this is amazing. I mean, we live in Montana. We get to see God's glory. I mean, if I lived in Bismarck, North Dakota, I'd be like, where's God? In Montana, <laughs> in Montana, I'd be, it's like, you can't miss him. But we're down at the brew fest, just, and we're just, it's like, look around. So he says, you must sit and you must recognize how marvelous the love of God is. And we're always looking for the next thing to get. We're always looking at what our neighbor has and we're missing this extravagant love that he has lavished on us. And so we need to sit sometimes and we need to embrace it and know it. Father loves you, but you gotta feel it. My son would never know that if I didn't just sit with him and tell him all the time that he loved, I love him. If he was running around all the time and never in my presence, he wouldn't feel it. But that boy feels it because I just constantly grab those cheeks and say, this daddy loves you. <laughs> See, he goes on and says, the world does not recognize us. Listen to what he said right there. The reason the world doesn't recognize who we are is that they didn't recognize him. See, if you're a Christian in here, if you're not, we're going to get to you in a minute. But if you're a Christian here, you feel kind of weird in this planet. You just feel off. Good. You should. And people look at us weird. And a lot, if we're walking truly in Father's love, we will look weird. You know why? Because the world doesn't understand what real love is. We think it's sex. That's all we think about is sex. And we're trying to say, we're well, just holding people back from loving each other. That's not the initial love. But we, if we feel the Father's embrace, and then we're talking about the Father's love, and we're walking around like just skipping, like, Father's so good, and I love everything. They're like, you're a weirdo. <sighs> And we are. The world's love says this is a love. You give it and you give it and give it, but if they don't give it back, then you take it away. And a love in the world is you have to earn that love. Everything is earned love. I'm gonna buy you a present, I'm gonna buy you this. And then the father's love comes around, he's just like, I'm just gonna give you love. And so we feel super weird on this planet. He says they haven't felt the father's love. And my point with that is, my friends, have you felt the father's love? Have you felt it? See, oftentimes, and I'm just gonna say this to you Christians in here, like we think we're being persecuted all the time. Like, oh, the world just hates us and man, everyone's just mad at me. And sometimes it's because we're jerks. You know what the world knows us as? Our political stances, and that makes me incredibly sad. That pleases Father. They know us as our political stances and what we're against. And it's time people stop knowing us as what we're against instead of who we are for. And we are for them. And we're for the Father's love. That word when he you know what he's talking about when he says like, we don't know what we'll look like, but we'll look like him. It comes from the Greek word shining. So we are, we just sit and bask in the Father's love and then it shines out of us. I'm shining. That's Moana. Come on, have some kids, watch some Disney movies, and you'll understand. <laughs> so not only do we embrace Father's love, but then we, ref we are a reflection of Father's love. So let me ask again, you Christians here, do people see you as a reflection of Father's love? Or is it like, I'm a Republican. <laughs> or they're like, man, I, I don't get that love, but I, I, that's, I don't get it, but that's sweet. And again, I'm not here to shame you. If they're not, if people around you aren't seeing that, you need to receive the Father's love today. You need to start receiving this Father's love for you. So it shines to the world. There's something incredibly attractive about love. There's something incredibly weird about it, but it's attractive where people are like, what do you have that I don't have? But for too long again, we've been protesting and we've been hoping bumper stickers on our cars and putting stuff on Facebook and we need to be reflections of the Father's love. So we need to rest in the Father's love. Listen to what Tozer says. Chris, Christians should be the most confident people in the world, not cocky or sure of ourselves, but sure of him. Sure of him. 
See, and then he says this really weird word that freaks me out forever because I've been taught this in Christianity. It says, and all who focus their hope on him will always be purifying themselves, just as Jesus is pure. And forever, I've been taught and I've thought this right, we're supposed to be becoming more pure. So I need to work really, really hard to get sin out of my life. And we always judge people who have different sins than us. You know how many people are just greedy? You know how many people who are workaholics, but yet they judge the druggie? And it's still the same? But then we read this, right? I've read this. It's like, they will purify themselves. So I think forever, when I became a Christian, I'm like, okay, I just need to get pure. I need to get sin out of my life. How do I do it? Okay. And all I got was a hernia. That's all I got. Because we're constantly ranking Christians. We're constantly ranking Christianity like, hmm, are they a real one? Hmm, by their purity. I'm not telling you sin doesn't matter. You should take your sin very seriously. And purity absolutely matters. But you know what I found in my own life? So I'm speaking for me, but I have seen this in other people. If you try to get sin out on your own, you always will replace it with something else. And it's usually self-righteousness and judgment. Yeah, you might not be getting drunk, but you're judging a lot of people. I think Jesus talked about that somewhere a lot. Because you got it out on your own. This, see, I see this all the time now with, with new Christians. They become new Christians. They're on fire for Jesus. They quit uh, getting drunk, getting high, having sex, and they're like feeling really good about it. But then they become these religious zealots. So the pendulum swings, and now they're just judging everybody. Can you believe that? Can you believe this? They're just judging everybody because they thought they got it out on their own. They just replaced it. So when he says this, I want to free you from this. He says, you will become pure when you're looking at Jesus. See, that's what I learned. If you are looking at Jesus, he will get this stuff out of your life. He will purify your life. And you should take sin very seriously. But you know when you know you're taking it the most seriously is when you know you can't get it out of your own life. Because you see it. And you're like, I can't do anything about it. And then Jesus says, I can. So he says, if you look at Jesus and you live in the Father's love and you just feel the embrace of Father's love, you will purify your life. So some of you who keep struggling with sin, you know what you need to do? You need to sit on your porch and just feel the Father's love and you will start getting over that sin. He goes on and says, oh, excuse me, this is a great quote. It says, so often well-meaning Christians pray for a visitation from God. I wanna see God, I wanna see God. But what he really wants is a habitation with us. He doesn't want to come into our lives as a guest while we are on our best behavior around him until he leaves. Y'all are, you're all doing pretty good in here right now. I don't know, I don't know these sins in your life. And so we put on our best behavior, our Sunday best. And Jesus is like, you know, I was in the car with you the other day when you were freaking out, right? <laughs> you know, I was there when you were watching that thing you shouldn't have been watching, Right? And he says, I'm there because I love you and I'm always gonna be there and I'm still there. Why don't you just give it to me? Go over to 1 John 4, great book. Those who are loved by God, let his love continually pour out from you to one another because God is love. You wanna know who God is? You wanna take all the 66 books in the Bible and put them into one thing, God is love. Even in his judgment, it's love because it's perfect. It's a perfect judgment. It's a judgment that will redeem and turn people to the right way. God is love. That's the three most important words you can ever know. Father is love. Everyone who loves is fathered by God and experience an intimate knowledge of him. The one who doesn't love has yet to know God for God is love. Now I want to turn this on you Christians who tend to judge people. Why do we do that? Don't, why are we judging them? They haven't felt the love of God. And we watch people on the news and we watch people in society and we watch our family members and we judge them and we're like, why are they doing that? They haven't felt the love of God. I have felt the love of God and I still do some of those things. This should change our whole view towards people. He says it should pour out of us. This love should pour out of us. Not rules, not regulations, not doctrine, not theology. Love should pour out of us. And then all those other things will line up. The light of God's love shined within us when he sent his matchless son into the world so that we might live through him. See, I, can f I realized this week as I was praying through this, I can fake love. I can fake it. 
right? Like when that person is annoying or that person's bothering you, you can put on the smile like, <laughs> yeah, get out of my face. Yeah, I know. Can you leave? It's like we can fake love so often. I can fake love. My, I've said this before. You know how many times I have been angry cleaning the house before? I'll show my wife. I'll do all the dishes and I'll clean everything up. That'll show her. Uh... She's like, fine, I'm going to get you angry more often because the house is looking great. (laughs) We can fake love. We can fake it. And that's why love is such a weird thing. This is why, I mean, I always, even like, again, to to the whole spiritual movement in, in, in the world right now where everyone wants just to be called spiritual. So they say it's a new love. We, that's like a karma love. Karma love is I'm going to love you so something good comes to me. That sounds a little selfish. But this is real love, and God can't fake it. You know why? Because God is love. It's not something he does. It's not something he even gives. It's who he is. And imagine how everything would change in our world, and in our lives, and in our marriages, and in our hearts, and everything, if we just rested and lived in this kind of love, that you are fully accepted and treasured and loved right where you sit, right now. It would change everything how we view people. It would change everything how we view our coworkers. If you're a boss, the people under you, it would change everything if you just lived in that love. But if you live in rules and doctrine and all those other things, you're going to give that kind of love out. It would change all our city if we could just embrace that there's nothing you can do anymore to receive Father's love. And you know how you want to, if you want to really know, if you want to really know that Father loves you, he said, I give you this amazing sign, and it's called my son Jesus on the cross. And that's the problem with us Christians, is we get older and we get older, and we want to move on to new doctrine and new theology and all that stuff, and we just become these religious zealots, and we need to go back to the gospel, the original truth, that God is love, and he sent his son for our sins. How much more does God have to prove to us that he loves us? I mean, I go, I go preach to prisoners uh, twice a year. We go over to Deer Lodge and I preach to these prisoners, these tattooed dudes, like ne- tattooed on their necks, on their heads, and I'll watch them ball like babies as I present Father's love to them. Because I want them to feel a sense of freedom even while they're in bars. And when they get out, if they do get out, I want them to live awesome lives for God. But I can tell you this. If Father came to me, Father God, and said, I'll tell you what, if you kill Easton... I will let every prisoner on the planet go free. Now look, there's days when I'm like, "Eh, he's yours. (laughs) That's not true. If God asked me to do that, I could not do that. I could not kill my own son so the rest of the prisoners go free. And so what reminds me of how Father loves me and how amazing his love is for me because he did do that. And let me flip the script a little bit. If Jesus was his son, his beloved treasure out of all the universe, and he was willing to give up his son for us, may I say that means you are his most valued treasure in the universe. And he wants you to feel it. And I want Zootown Church to feel it. And I want to feel it. And just continually look to Christ. And, continue, and this would affect everything. Imagine if you lived in this. It would affect everything, even our causes. Everyone's got a cause now. Everyone's really upset. Some of those causes are great, but you see how angry and vicious they are. They're just as bad as the people that they're going against. Nietzsche said that. An atheist said, beware when you're fighting an enemy, you do not become that enemy. And that's what you see. And I'm, I'm just here to tell you straight up. When you look at Rachel Maddow on MSNBC and you look at Sean Hannity, they're the same person. They're just on different ends of the spectrum. And they need to feel Father's love and embrace is what they do so then they can love each other. But we get caught up in that. But you can have wonderful causes. You can do wonderful things. But it has to flow through the Father's love. And that's what he's saying right here. You see, think about what he's saying with Jesus. He says, now we live through the life of Jesus. Jesus came to show you and me how to live. And he taught us how to live in the Father's embrace. That's all Jesus did. You know how many times Jesus said, I do not trust man. I do not give myself to man. So I do everything that the Father tells me to do. That's, where, that's why John says, we are now, if you live in Father's love, you are fathered by God. What does a father do? He guides you, he protects you, he tells you where to go, he showers his love on you. 
And so if we live in Jesus, he's really showing us, like, I just live in the Father's embrace. I live in the Father's love. And what that does is you begin to trust your Father. The one thing Jesus showed us over and over is you can trust that your Father in heaven is amazing and he's good and you will make it. And that's exactly what he's trying to show us is we just rest in this love and throw all the religion, all the doctrine, all the Christianese language we like to use, throw all of that out and just sit in Father's love. And so I give you this simple truth. Father loves you. Father loves you. Father loves you. Father loves you. And you begin to trust him more with your money. You begin to trust him more with your marriage. You begin to trust him more with everything because love equals trust. My son knows I love him and he uses it to his advantage all the time. My son still doesn't sleep that great. But I told you when I do sit lay down with him, I just tell him how much I love him all the time. A couple weeks ago, he kept getting up. He got up like three times a night. And I realized we kind of judge our kids for that, but I do that sometimes, right? Sometimes I don't sleep that great. And he's a human. He's just a smaller human, right? So by the third time, I, I, we sent him to bed. I was feeling kind of bad because he was probably scared or something. So I go lay down with him in bed. And he's laying there and acting like he's asleep. And I go, Bubba, that's what I call him. I go, Bubba, do you want me to sleep with you? And he opens up one eye and he smiles. And he goes, yeah, and tomorrow night too. <laughs> <laughs> It was so clever. It's so good. Because that boy, it, dude, seriously, that touched my heart. That means my boy knows I love him. He knows I will do anything for him. And he's going to manipulate me in that love. And that's okay. And that's what Father's trying to just feel that embrace. We live through Jesus. We live through him. And Jesus showed us, Father is love. And we need to throw all this stuff away and just start embracing the love of the Father. He ends it in verse 10. He says, this is love. So you want to know what love is? This is it. He loved us long before we loved him. Think about that. We always think we're accepting God. I received Jesus into my life. Mm, I think he received you. You did not love father first. Father loved you first. And that should give you great hope because he saw all your sins. He saw, before you even had a choice to sin, before your first sin, before your last sin, he already chose you to be loved in him. It was his love, not ours. He proved it by sending his son to be the pleasing sacrificial offering to take away the sins of the world. We are under so much pressure in our society, in our world, to always prove and prove and prove and prove and prove. And we want to always show what we're doing. And he says, no, 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 you can't do that with Father. Father first wants to tell you that he loves you. You can't beat him to it. No, no, I love God first. He's like, no, I loved you first. No, I loved you. No, I loved you first. And this is why there's so many angry Christians. Because they're constantly trying to prove that they're good Christians. And I have felt this. As a pastor, I can tell you, I felt it as a Christian. It's like you're constantly trying to prove that you're this. And people critique you. And they look at your life. And they look at your doctrine. They look at this. And they're like, oh, what about this? What about that? And so there's this weird pressure. We become angry. And it's the same reason why Muslims go and blow themselves up to please God. Because they want to show God they love him. And this whole verse says, no, no, no. Father loves you. Father loves you. Give your best for God. We've been told in church, give your best for God. And Jesus is our God's like, no, I'm giving my best for you. And his name is Jesus and he's my son. And that's the best I have to offer you. You see, it says that Jesus' sacrifice was a pleasing aroma to God. God just sat there. And to us, it looks gross. It looks dirty. It looks disgusting. He was dying naked on a cross. And father loved it because it was freeing his kids from sin. And do you realize that now if we live in Jesus, if you live in Jesus, you are a pleasing aroma to God? You ever thought about that? I mean, I've taken my kids' stuff off after soccer. It doesn't smell very good. My truck smells terrible all the time. And it says we are a pleasing aroma to God and in our deepest, darkest sin and in those hardest places, it says we are a pleasing aroma to God because of Jesus. And you know what that means? And I want you to see, receive this right now. The Father not only loves you, the Father really likes you. Have you ever thought that? Why didn't they tell me this in Bible college? Why is it that all the religious people who've come here and critiqued me and put me down never said, Father loves you. This is how you're going to change. Father loves you. 
And you know what? He really likes you. Will you receive that? That in your deepest, darkest sins, your deepest, darkest places, Father really likes you. He likes being around you. He likes talking to you. I love driving with my kids, especially Easton. He'll start telling me a story. It doesn't make sense most of the time, but I love him talking to me. And the Father loves it when you talk to him. We think, well, I've got to say this right thing in this Christian lingo and all that. And he's just like, you guys are weirdos, man. Just talk to me. Father really likes you. Father really likes you. I don't care if you're 80 years old in here. Father really, really likes you. He's seen everything you've ever done and he approves of you and he really, 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 really likes hanging out with you. You know, I know this is the Apostle Peter. He goes and he denies Jesus three times. He's like, even if everyone else goes, I will not, even unto death. So of course, he goes, denies Jesus three times. I don't even know the man. And that verse, every time I read it, oh, it gets my heart. It says, Peter went away and he wept bitterly. Oh, have I been there. I was just in church, Jesus, as a new believer. I was just in church, man, and now I'm smoking pot. Some of you, you come to Zoo Town, and then you go out on Monday, and you struggle. And you're like, is this real? Yes, it's real. It's real. It's real. And he goes to Peter, and Peter's ashamed, and he tried to hide from Jesus, and Jesus says, no, we're going to walk. And he looks at Peter, because you know what Peter thought? Peter thought, I know Father forgives me, but I bet he'll never like me again. And that's what we think. I know he forgives me, but he sure don't like me. And so you know what Jesus did? Three times he said, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And every time in Greek, it's a different word for love. The one's agape love. That's godly love. The second one was phileo love. And what it means is friendship love. And what Jesus was saying to Peter is, yes, I like you. I love you. I forgive you, but I really like you. And I like spending time with you. You're my friend, Peter. And he cries that out to you in those dark spots. He cries out, yes, I love you. Yes, I forgive you. But I really like you, even though you're caught up in this porn and you're caught up in this drinking and you're caught up in all this stuff. I still really like you. And that would make us look at everything different, ourselves, our God, everything, if we could get that, that he not only loves you, he really, really likes you. One man writes this, Father is longing to have the same kind of relationship with us as he had with Jesus. Do you know that? The only thing we need to do is to receive the love of our Father by faith. With this level of supernatural disclosure regarding the great and awesome love of our Father, we are compelled to respond with the same passion and dedication. If you're not passionate in your Christian faith, if you're struggling in your Christian faith, you need to sit down and get the love of the Father again. It's not about you giving more money or serving at church or anything like that. It's about sitting with your father and receiving this love again. We are compelled to respond the same way. By doing so, we will not only be healed of the orphan spirit, we will also be conformed into the likeness of his own son. And therefore, we will be justified and glorified. We're going to watch a quick video and then we're going to wrap it up. Band, you can come up during the video too. I know you can see the mess of this world and think there is no love. We have unconfirmed reports this morning that a plane has crashed. Reports of a shooting at a local high school. Uh, You will see terrible things on the news and even witness them personally. Remember, my son, even the word love has been hijacked to mean something I never intended it to. They think love means doing whatever they want. But my love will motivate you to do what I know is right. You will be tempted by many loves out there, but know that my love is what's real. If you chase after other loves, it will not sway my love for you, and you will always be my child. Love, Dad. Listen to this story. On July 31st, 1838, on the island of Jamaica, a man named William Nibs gathered 10,000 slaves for a great praise gathering. They were celebrating the new Emancipation Proclamation Act that would abolish slavery on the island. 
They had built an immense coffin and into it they placed whips, branding irons, chains, fetters of all kinds, slave garments, and all the things that represented the terrible slavery system that was now coming to a welcomed end. At the first stroke of the midnight bell, Nibs shouted out, the monster is dying. And at each stroke of the bell that followed, this cry was repeated and great crowd began to join in the cry. At the twelfth stroke, 10,000 slave voices cried out, the monster is dead, the monster is dead, let us bury him. And then they screwed the coffin lid down and lowered it into a huge grave and covered it up. That night, every heart rejoiced and 10,000 voices grew hoarse, shouting and crying with joy. Once they were in bondage to slavery, but now they were free. The sad part about this story is there were many slaves on remote parts of the island and they were never told that they were free. And their masters never told them that that had happened. And they lived in slavery for years because no one would go to them and tell them that. And I say this because you Christians have been living in slavery for years. And it's from well-meaning Christians. But we have preached religion and we have preached horrible stuff to try to prove that we're good Christians to Father. I'm here to free you today in the Father's love that you are no longer a slave to sin and you are no longer a slave to ever trying to earn your Father's love again. It is freely given at the cross. And I want Zootown Church to feel it. And I want that town to feel his love, not our politics, not our judgment, not our rules. I want them to see the love of Zootown Church. But we gotta feel it first. We have to feel it. And my prayer for you today is that you feel it. You feel it again. Or maybe you feel it for the first time and recognize I've been kind of religious and man, I put some weird pressure on my kids and some weird pressure on other people and I need to receive this love for the first time in my life. Maybe that's you. We're gonna have a prayer team up here. Some of you need to get out of your seats and receive this love from God. If you are here and you are not a follower of Christ, that is the symbol that Father loves you and it will change your whole life. And it's not about you working to get sin out of your life. It's about you gazing in awe at the Father's love and that sin will start getting out of your life. I just recognize this week, I am so proud of what Father has done in my heart. And I'm always looking at how far I have to go because that's what religious people put on me all the time. I'm looking how far Father has brought me in my love for him and his love for me. But you gotta feel it first. This is our anchor. This verse right here is an anchor for your soul today. Receive it. I'm speaking to you. Receive it. I'm speaking the Father's heart to you right now. So now I live with the confidence that there is nothing in the universe with the power to separate us from God's love. Last time I checked, nothing means nothing. I'm convinced that his love will triumph over death, life's troubles, fallen angels, or dark rulers in the heavens. There is nothing in our present or future circumstances that can weaken his love. There is no more power above us or beneath us, no power that could ever be found in the universe that can distance us from God's passionate love who is lavished upon us through our Lord Jesus Christ, the anointed one. I pray, my fellow brothers and sisters, that you just sit in the embrace of Father's love and you receive it and you give it out and that's what we're known for at Zootown Church lovers of God shining image bearers of the love of God to a community that desperately needs it I don't care if you are gay in here I don't care if you are straight in here I don't care if you're Democrat I don't care if you're Republican I don't care if you're black I don't care if you're white this is one offering from God who loved you first and you stand there and you receive this love that he has already given to you amen